uh, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's webinar on how you can use open data to make a difference. Uh, we are recording this and we'll circulate a link to the recording on the RTG YouTube channel uh, over the next couple of days once we've processed it. So you can review what we've said or share it with colleagues that can't be with us live. Uh, please do feel free to use the chat to uh, ask questions and things like that and talk to each other um, and questions I will pick up at the end. Um, so um, what we're going to look at uh, today is we'll start with the definition, of course, uh, always helpful, um, and then um, look at um, some of the uses of transport data, some of the challenges of using data to make a difference, particularly uh, when you're using it with other data sets um, and um, what you can do to uh, help take up and some examples uh, towards the end. Um, and then we'll wrap up with any questions and let you get back to whatever you've got on this afternoon. So what do we mean by open data? Um, there are a number of different definitions used by various organisations, of course. Uh, nobody can um, entirely agree, but there's some fairly good commonality that it's data that should be able to be freely used uh, and shared. You should be able to redistribute it um, and um, use it for your own purposes. Um, provenance is a key thing um, and a key thing with trust, but we'll pick up that um, in a bit. So um, why is open data something that's been being talked about for quite a long time now? Well, uh, if you go back 10 plus years um, to the days of um, uh, eGov in the UK, um, there was a really big push about open data in the middle noughties. Uh, and there were politicians talking about if we do open data, then it'll help with all sorts of things and it'll uh, grow the economy by two billion pounds a year. Um, whether it's achieved that or not, I don't know, but we'll have a look at um, one organisation's um, uh, economic impact um, in a bit. But uh, generally, uh, across different countries uh, in different um, um, places around the world. Um, people are seeing um, a number of different impacts, probably the biggest of which um, is all about transparency and accountability. Uh, it helps government and public institutions be more open about what they're doing particularly where they're making policy decision uh, and evidence bases available and spend profiles and things like that. Um, and that was one of the uh, key things that certainly the UK government were encouraging citizens to do with open data as it was becoming available, uh, empowering them to uh, us to make informed decisions and to become for those of you that remember, armchair auditors um, to uh, do analysis on what government was spending to find out where it could be spent better, where there was waste and things like that. Um, but um, we know that there's some um, innovation, which we'll look at today, as well as some economic growth that does happen with the release of data openly. Um, it certainly helps people collaborate. Um, researchers and organisations can do things with data and work with data sets that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get access to uh, and to uh, link up with 
uh, other people using similar data to work together to uh, develop things or just to learn things that help their organizations. Um, it does help improve services and um, we've got an example of one from Leeds Council um, in a bit. Um, that's both um, public services and private services. Um, increasingly, uh, private sector organisations are making data more openly available uh, and seeing the benefits of that. Um, probably, uh, aside from transport, the biggest users of open data are scientific and medical companies. Um, in the pandemic, there was an awful lot of sharing of data openly uh, between uh, the scientific and medical communities, and that really helped drive uh, vaccinations and ways of handling the pandemic. And uh, increasingly, there's a push for environmental data to be made available. A lot of the uh, analysis about habitat loss and climate change is being uh, helped by the availability of more and more data. So um, those are some of the impacts. Um, we are, of course, particularly interested in transport data, which for many years really has been the poster child of the open data movement. Um, it's relatively uh, easy to make the data available. You know, simple things like timetables, uh, publish them in a standard way, and that's helped a good number of different organisations create themselves from scratch. You know, City Mapper and Move It wouldn't exist without the availability of open data. Um, for example. Um, and uh, an awful lot of us use open data to, for our journeys uh, every single day. And so it's often held up as the, uh, as the, as the good example, the poster child of open data. Um, and uh, certainly within Artig, we get different uh, user groups uh, contacting us, asking us about how people have gone about making data open uh, on a pretty regular basis. Um, but, you know, um, Google relies on open data as well, as does Apple Maps and, and um, things that we use to help navigate around as well. So having said that um, it's used by lots of people, um, UK government is one of the um, governments around the world that makes more data openly available than most. Um, and um, the 2021 usage um, survey uh, looked at what people were using, the different data sets that were uh, available for, and transport is by far and away the biggest uh, in terms of the number of apps that public are able to use. Um, and so that just sort of highlights the fact that actually um, what we do in transport uh, is really important. Um, one of the first large organisations that made their data open and took the decision to uh, open things up uh, was Transport for London. Um, back in the uh, mid noughties um, and that's had really quite a big impact um, such that um, back in 2017 Deloitte did a uh, report looking at the value that has been generated uh, from the TfL open data um, as a follow-up report there was one done uh, earlier than that as well, but updated um, in 2017. Um, it was quite interesting. Um, Vernon Everett, who was the transport commissioner at the time for TfL, now doing interesting things in Manchester, where he's got a similar role. Um, back um, then when they started to open things up, they couldn't really know what was going to happen. 
because not many other organizations had made their data available but they knew something was going to happen um, and so they opened it up to see what happens um, and that has resulted in a huge number of different apps being available how you choose from 600 apps as to which one you're going to use to help your journey i don't know but um you know there are always some good ones and some bad ones but there's a lot of apps using it um and really interesting for me is the uh, the demand for public transport in london increased um at the same time that data was being more openly available and was becoming more available through apps which uh, if you think back to sort of you know 15 16 17 years ago uh, mobile phones were just beginning to become properly smart and app stores were being launched um, and it was quite an interesting time but that um, coincidence perhaps but um, hopefully you go it was unmet demand um, and the increase in public transport use in London is really quite exciting um, from an economic point of view and making public transport more sustainable. Um, Londoners uh, save quite a lot of money a year in saved time and lower information costs um, and uh, there are uh, a number of companies that have started up uh, purely on the basis of uh, the, the openness of Transport for London's data. Um, and um, from a TfL point of view, because what's in it for them? Well, until very recently, they didn't have their own uh, app um, and they pointed people to uh, the myriad of, of apps out there and they still do um, their app uh, is fairly uh, basic but it's made quite a lot of savings and created some revenue for them as well through their consulting arm um, so um, there are benefits for organizations making data available as well um, so um, we're not the only country um, doing things with open data there's a European directive that's just going through the process at the moment, uh, which requires public sector data to be reused and uh, made open, bearing in mind that most European countries operate a franchise model, uh, all of the timetables, locations and um, passenger demand for example uh, will all be um, opened up and mobility so transport type stuff um, congestion roadworks um, scooters all sorts of things um, fit into mobility it's one of their high value and high priority sets of data to uh, become open um, and it's through that directive that there's quite a lot of work going on at the moment on data standardization in Europe which we've talked about in previous sessions uh, and we'll no doubt talk about in future sessions as well so uh, it's bearing benefit to us as well. Um, as a country uh, there was last year a national data strategy uh, and earlier this year the transport data strategy came out. Uh, we held a session on it last month if you want to find out more about it. But fundamentally, it's all about making more data more available and reusable for people to uh, do the sort of things that we'll uh, find out about in a second. So there are challenges um, particularly um, when you start to make data uh, available um, at scale um, open data isn't free um, in the broadest sense um, to meet the criteria if 
we look back to the definitions that we started with um, it needs to be free for people to consume but it does actually cost to um, either be collected um, and created in some in some cases um, but for things like a, a bus timetable and things like that the cost is in standardizing it and making sure that it meets all of the required quality criteria um, for some other data sets um, there may be a bit more cost in human resource and systems and things like that to collect it uh, clean it and make it available um, and that's really where we need to be thinking as an industry is what next what is going to be most useful for people uh, for companies to actually be able to make a difference and do things um, one of the challenges though is with the likes of London uh, making data available open at no cost um, and pretty much everywhere does it for public transport um, if you talk to a data consumer and go yes of course we can make that data available but it's going to cost you because we've got to do a load of work then they go eh, eh. people are not interested in paying for data um, even if they are creating uh, benefit for themselves um, that's quite a hard set of conversations but um, for some of the more value add and new data sets that you might think about making available um, there has been some recent success in benefit sharing so somebody getting access to new data creates a new tool gets new insights and things like that making that available in some mutually beneficial way um, has been happening on a few occasions um, people are increasingly wanting more demand based stuff um, what are journey histories what's the demand for travel from A to B uh, to help identify commercial opportunities um, that's um, pushing on personal data if you're not careful um, and so needs some careful thought uh, bar things like fares uh, how much does it cost from A to B that's becoming available through bus open data service for those of you that are watching what's going on with that um, but um, you know travel patterns and things like that is probably the next um, set of conversations that's going to be had so if you're making data available um, then perhaps the biggest challenge that you've got is management um you know yes there are technical problems um but there's pretty much always a solution out there somewhere now um but it's actually the management how do you make sure that the data is the right quality sustainable uh, and supportable in the long run um and the discussions with um manage senior managers and politicians if you're an authority about we want to make this data available and this is why they're probably the hardest conversations but as with lots of things once a politician um, gets behind something then uh, it tends to happen and it can happen at pace uh, and that's why uh, the uk government's been able to do quite a lot in making data available that's why bus open data program came about because politicians uh, got behind the idea and made it happen through legislation um so it's all very well making it available and the business case for making data available um, and developing tools and things like that off the back of it uh, is much easier to do in a city um, but what about those areas that are rural that have got lower population density and you, know, you can make a case for why somebody might want to develop an app uh, for travel in London much more easily than you can for uh, I don't know somewhere even you know a city like Leicester which was what must have half a million people um 
in its travel catchment. Um, but that's nothing compared to the five or six million that, that London has. Um, for app developers, scale does actually matter and make a difference. Um, and um, that's one of the, uh, the challenges is how do we make things uh, equitable across the country and um, those areas that are often more difficult to get funding for uh, also get the benefits that accrue from making data openly available. Um, so that's to do that, you need some aggregation, you need to bring things together for scale. Um, it works for London uh, just on its own um, and uh, as one of the first cities in the world to make data available, developers flocked to it um, to use its data. Uh, it was much harder to have conversations, you know, uh, saying, you know, can you develop an app for my city um, when you've got far fewer people? So um, what you need to do is aggregate data. Um, BODS does it, Traveline has been doing it for a long time. Um, and with that aggregation, not only comes scale, but also simplicity. If you've only got to, to go to one place, somebody's much more likely to um, use the data um, than if they've got to go to multiple places. Um, uh, Traveline, uh, the next, their next buses service, their stop departure live service, um, had to integrate with dozens of real time systems. Uh, why would a app developer want to do that? Um, you know, they're just not going to put that effort in because there's the economic cost of doing that is greater than anything that they would ever see uh, as a return from their particular use. So by travel line making that available in one place from all of the, the dozens of different systems, people do actually use it because it's much simpler to use. Um, and um, that's why um, travel line and BODS are important from a transport point of view um, about making data available. And that's why the transport data strategy is important um, because uh, that is going to bring a number of different data sets together that currently are dispersed amongst local authorities. It's going to make, well, it already is through Street Manager, Roadworks much simpler and easier to get access to. You don't have to negotiate with commercial organisations or lots of different local authorities. You can go to a single point um, and we'll look in a bit at an example, not of a national um, aggregation, but a uh, but a regional um, aggregation, which has brought um, benefit. So it's all very well bringing the data together um, in a single place, but people have got to trust it um, and for it to be usable um, and trustable. It's got to be standardised. You've got to know that it's always going to be in the same format. It's going to be consistent. Uh, over time and the quality is going to be a known thing um, and you know if you're looking at data from place A it's going to be the same as it is from place B um, and when there are changes it's going to be updated in a timely manner um, because if you've got inconsistent data if you're not quite sure what's going to happen, you've got slightly different formats from different um, locations. The amount of effort that you've got to put in as a data consumer means that you're much less likely to to use it unless you've got a really strong business case for it. Um, and then you've got to make it um, open and available in as friendly a way as possible. Um, these days that might be APIs which are simply documented with just the basic information um, and 
um, using formats that people are comfortable with. Um, one of the uh, key things that BODS, for example, did was actually make data available in GTFS format rather than Trans Exchange. A lot of the de software developers and app developers that work worldwide prefer the data formats that uh, GTFS uses and the structures and the languages for programming and things like that than Trans Exchange. But Trans Exchange is much richer. It's got all the permutations and nuances on. And so there are trade offs, but um, by making it available in as easy to consume way, more people are going to have a play with it going to start to do interesting things with it. Um, and that's really what we want people to be doing. Um, and the next sort of iterations um, of use of data, um, we really need to be encouraging people that aren't public transport data experts, aren't particularly interested in transport data, per se, but interested in other things to include it uh, in their apps, in their services to encourage people to use public transport, which is what we're after. Um, but achieving that means that we've got to provide it in as easily consumable and friendly way as we can. Um, and that helps people produce things. You know, we'll have all seen things like this. Um, where it's, uh, you know, I'm here, how far can um, I uh, travel within a period of time? Um, uh, you probably use it professionally if you're in an authority for transport planning um, and network planning if you're an operator. Um, there are loads of these out there now um, in a whole variety of different um places from all sorts of suppliers rather than the few that used to be um, around. Um, other interesting things with um, open data looking slightly wider um, in York, um, they have an open services directory, which is a, a database uh, or it's got thousands of groups and activities. Uh, in it, if you want a, something to do at a weekend, if you want to know where you know a child minder is, if you're you know looking to move somewhere, where can I get childcare? Um, where can I get uh, you know wh where's the local so social services? Where's the drop-in centre? Um, it's got all of this in there, um, and that enables anybody in York to produce something off the back of that. Um, from the one place, they don't need to go away and, and gather it around. And so that means that um, all of these opportunities and services, they're available through lots of the local parish council and um, other websites because it's very simple to do that integration rather than somebody having to maintain static pages and go away and find things when things change and things like that. Um, and York themselves reckon that they're saving about 50 grand a year in contact centre time. Um, just people phoning up going, where is this or what time is this? Um, and so by bringing things together, uh, not transport in this example, but bringing stuff together, um, you, know, you can uh, save effort and get benefit. Um, Data Mill North is an interesting example, um, came out of the Open Data Institute, which set up a um, northern um, outpost um, and they've turned themselves into Data Mill North. Um, and they've been over the last few years busy working with authorities across the north. They're based in Leeds, so a lot of them are sort of around the West Yorkshire area, but got Manchester and Liverpool and uh, you know um, Northumberland data and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, last time I looked 
Um, they've got over 600 data sets uh, bringing stuff together into the one place. It's not all transport by a long way. Um, but there's all sorts of interesting stuff in there. Um, and if you're wanting to look for data, you just can go there. It means that people are more likely to use it because it's all in the one place. Um, and they've been very successful at it. Um, and there are over 30 different products that have been produced, created, in some cases, organizations and companies set up to use that data. So over 30, that's quite impressive. Um, and some of the uh, interesting things. So if you're like me, um, you're forever forgetting what day um, you know, your paper bin is, um, no matter how many weeks of, you know, how long it's been running, it's been consistent. I'm always looking at my local authority website to find out, well, through the data the Data Mill North been making available a number of authorities, including Leeds, they've got an app that, that uses that and makes it really easy for people to find out. Um, and it's got a lot of take up. Um, again, Leeds also say that they're saving contact centre time as a result of it. So some um, commercial benefit um, there um, and um, non-commercial but uh, really valuable um, if you're you need somewhere safe you're feeling scared you're feeling at risk when you're out and about um, the safe places uh, scheme um, they've brought all the data together across the country um, and there's an app that's been created off the back of that um, to help people find out where the nearest safe spaces for them to go to um, anywhere in the UK. And so uh, some social benefit there. Um, and there's loads of other examples that they've got. Um, and uh, if you're thinking, what can we do with data, then um, it's worth having a look at what they do. It's also worth talking to them. They're a really friendly bunch um, to help you get your head around what you might be able to do and how you might be able to work with colleagues in an authority or with other organisations to get the benefits of aggregating lots of different sets of data uh, into the one place. Um, it's not just um, the traditional public transport users that we really want using uh, open data and transport data. Um, for those of you that have tried to encourage people to change modes, to change behaviours and things like that, you know that there are very few opportunities to get people to change their travel behaviours once they're ingrained. Uh, uh, moving house is one of those. Um, and um, the main um, house searching platforms these days actually use public transport data um, to help people decide where they're going to live. Um, and that's one of the one of the key points at which people make uh, travel choice decisions which stick for a long time. Um, and um, interestingly, Zoopla said in a recent um, uh, report that a fifth of searches for properties uh, use the travel time functions and over half of those are looking at public transport journey times. Um, and so you like to think that a few people um, off the back of that um, actually make a conscious decision to um, use public transport rather than the private car off the back of it. Um, and so um, as transport data becomes more readily available consistently in aggregated forms, then uh, I'd like to think that we'll start to see more use cases like that uh, popping up around the place. Um, venues these days often um, have 
things about um, how to get to locations from uh, from uh, you know where people live and work and things like that on public transport. Um, again, you know, as data becomes more openly available consistently, um, we'll see more of that. Another UK example, this um, bar European freight market. Um, is extremely competitive um, and cost driven. Um, rail freight um, is um, being pushed really quite heavily from an environmental point of view, um, particularly um, with um, environmental concerns and cost concerns of maintaining roads and things like that. Um, and rail freight has been under pressure like it is um, in the UK as well um, against uh, road competition um, and so um, the European freight um, uh, group that, that encourages um, international freight transfer on rail and things like that um, has pulled together uh, some really interesting tools um, using open data, combining not the rail industry's rail map data, but using the open rail map data because, as they say, it is more accurate and more detailed than the rail industry's data, which is fascinating. Combining that with open street map and, and other sets of data to help um, freight companies um, plan freight routes and use uh, rail freight more and they are seeing people using this and then going on and buying uh, rail freight services off the back of it um, using open data as the source um, and so uh, some that's a really interesting uh, use case I think. So um, that sort of provides some interesting cases of where people are using um, open data for some different things, not just um, public transport, but in combination with public transport. Um, that's uh, what we've got prepared today. I don't know whether anybody's got any thoughts or comments or questions on what you've heard. Um, Want to know more about something um feel free to um stick something in the chat or uh, raise a hand while you're having to think about that um the next artig uh, face to face event is looking at the off bus experience so um how you get to um the bus stop wayfinding what you experience at the bus stop, you know, shelters, printed information, electronic displays, accessibility requirements. Um, that's on the 20th of June um, down in Greenwich at Transport for London offices. Um, you can find out booking details through the RTIG website. And uh, along with uh, the other events that we've got planned uh, going forward um, and if nobody's got any questions hopefully you found that interesting and useful this afternoon um, and I will um, let you get on with the rest of the day now so uh, thank you all um, if you want to get in contact find out more about the work of Artig uh, or any follow-up questions or anything like that then please do feel free to get in contact. Thank you all for joining this afternoon. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.